if you uh, we're now going to start. So welcome, Lucy. Well, thank you so much for this invitation to join you today in Connecticut, but also wherever people are in the world. I am speaking to you from England. I'm UK based historian, but very much appreciating this opportunity. And thank you for my introduction there. It's, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk about this work in particular. And so what I'd like to do today, I'm very informal, as you can see, I'm not going to be screen sharing. I'm going to be taking you through some of the sources that I've used to research this book, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz. There we go. And I'm going to be introducing you to some of the dressmakers. And I want to be looking at some of the really quite profound, um, quite powerful themes that this book brought up for me while I was researching. So that might be looking at perpetrator psychology, the way that um, Nazi perpetrators and bystanders were motivated by greed and by profit, which is perhaps something we overlook. But because this book is about the dressmakers, I also want to be talking about survivor psychology and survivor strategies. And so words like resilience uh, do come up very often. So a little more about my background. Um, it seems quite an improbable background, perhaps a degree in English literature and then in medieval studies. What does that have to do with mid, mid 20th century history and the Holocaust? And actually the medieval studies degree was one of the most exciting educational experiences of my life because I came from a world of, of stories and poems and, and I suppose documents in a way, but never the real documents, just printed in books. And even at that time, even as an undergraduate, I was interested in fragments, in stories that are not quite told, that are lost. And that drew me to what was then called the literature of atrocity, Holocaust writings. And so while my tutors were saying, you should be writing about the ancient Greeks and iambic pentameters and tragic figures uh, such as Antigone, I was saying, I, I want to look at these postcards that were thrown onto railway tracks by people being deported to their deaths. I want to look at the fragments of diaries that are buried in the ground of camps. I want to look at, it was the idea of salvaging things. And so when I came to do medieval studies, may not seem connected, but medieval studies, you look at text, but you also look at documents. You very physically handle the material culture, you know, vellum with, with big wax seals. So you get a physical appreciation. You have the historical backup, but then also the archeology, span the objects that are found. And sometimes the objects that aren't found become really important. So since then I've focused on dress history. And I have over the years, and it's been many years, I've had people saying, oh, come on clothes. What do clothes have to do with history, right? They're just fashion, it's just clothes, as if it's frivolous. But I'm going to, I'm going to guess that we're all wearing them right now. Uh, and if not, don't turn your videos on. <laughs> clothes are a massively important part of our identity, how we present ourselves or, or how we hide ourselves. They're an extremely important part of our culture. The way that we show status, sometimes gender, the way we show class, the way we show our cultural backgrounds, individuality or fitting in, all of those things. And clothes also tell us a great deal about human technology, human trade structures and networks. And the jacket I'm wearing now is actually an American jacket from the 1940s with enormous shoulder pads. I think you could land a bomber plane on them. And it's one of the limited, uh, the limitation orders that America has during the 1940s, not quite rationing, but just a little bit more utilitarian. And I don't know who, I don't know who made this jacket. I don't know who designed it. I don't know who wove the fabric. I don't know who stitched it. I don't even know who wore it. But clothes always do have stories, even if we don't know what those stories are. So this is where I come after, and it has been nearly 20 years actually, I've been long interested in the intersection between economics, the textile industry, and these fragments of stories of the Holocaust. And many years ago, back in 2008, I came across reference to a fashion salon 
in Auschwitz, which has to be one of the most discordant phrases ever. This is a concentration camp, an extermination center synonymous with mass murder, with brutality, with suffering, and a fashion salon. We think of fashion salons as, as quite glamorous. We think of the world of couture and style and sensuality of fabrics. How could there be a fashion salon in Auschwitz? At the, when, I, when I first came across this mention, uh, I, I wasn't able to track down anything more about it. There were a few names mentioned. They were just first names. There was Marta and Bracha and Katka and Rene and Hunya and Mimi, Mansi, Lulu, Borishka. And at the time I thought, how, how can we possibly find out more? I wrote uh, a young adult novel based on what little I knew and what I could draw on, imagining what on earth would it be like to be a girl sewing in Auschwitz or in a concentration camp setting. The novel was published, it's called The Red Ribbon, and a very interesting discussion there about Holocaust fiction, you know, the, the perils of it. And in this case, at least, the story enabled me to find out the truth because the story was, was published uh, and received a very good response worldwide. And it was read in Israel. And I received emails saying, well, my aunt, was one of the real dressmakers at Auschwitz. My mother was one of the dressmakers. And then my grandmother, Kate said one email, ran the dressmaking workshop in Auschwitz. So from here, when you have names, you can go into the archives. And inevitably documentation is going to be one of the, the very strongest sources. And we know that the Nazis had an obsessive yet selective um, system of bureaucracy. So in some cases I was able to track down, and I'll show you, this is just a copy obviously, so documents such as prisoner registration cards, and this one is for Mansi Birnbaum, and her profession is listed on the card, so this is from her registration in Auschwitz, it's listed as Schneiderin, or Taylor, Tayloress, as she might have said. As we know, the Nazis also destroyed many documents, and so there are some prisoner registration cards and they give little glimpses and it, it's quite something as a historian to go into archives when you suddenly think, I know this woman, I know this, now this links to this, that and the other. So there are, this, there, there is this element of documentation. But I think for me the most profound things about linking up with the families was a sense that these aren't just names on forms and cards, these are real people. And I had the great privilege of being introduced, if you will, to some of the dressmakers with their photographs. And it had a very emotional response actually, having read about women, having found some of their names in archives and then to see their faces. So if I can introduce some of the women, so to give you a little background, if you haven't read the book, there were roughly 25 young, mainly Jewish prisoners who were selected from Auschwitz and Birkenau camps to come and work in a dedicated fashion salon at the Auschwitz main camp. This salon was set up by the commandant's wife, Hedwig Huss. Now Hedwig wasn't known for her particular fashion style. She wasn't a fashion leader like many of the elite SS women who were photographed in elegant journals. I have some of them here, such as Dimod fashion magazine. This is, has a very strong national socialist uh, link. And you can see these elegant imageries of, of women. And inside, particularly in the 1930s, there would be images of Emmy Goering and Magda Goebbels wearing incredibly stylish gowns in very elegant surroundings, sending a message to the outside world that that these people have power, they have privilege, they have taste, and that Germany means business. So Hedwig Huss was not such a woman as this. She was married to Rudolf Huss, who had entered his SS career at Dachau first, and then at Sachsenhausen, and then he took over as commandant of Auschwitz. And Hedwig moved to a villa in Auschwitz, and you can visit the site now, you can't 
visit the house. But when you visit Auschwitz main camp with the high brick walls, you just look along a little way from the original crematorium building and you see the house. And she called it paradise. It was a villa that had been stolen from its rightful Polish owner. And it has a garden running along the back of it that Hedwig Huss used prisoner labor from Auschwitz camp to turn into this most beautiful garden filled with roses and bees and pergolas and a swimming pool. And it is just across the wall from the camp. So Hedwig moved here with her family and everything in that house was stolen. And it came mainly from the plunder warehouses in Auschwitz called Canada. And these started out as a small collection of workshops. They expand into well over 30 huge barrack warehouses and numerous other offshoots. Whatever she wanted could be provided. She wanted clothes. And at first she had two local Polish Christian women come in to sew for her, but the wages were so bad. These women said, you know, we can't, we can't work for these wages. And then in spring 1942, Hedwig has a little boost to her household. Nice for her, but essentially what it is, is the arrival of the first official Jewish transports into Auschwitz and their women. So on these first transports, the, all of these, these women here came on the first transports in March and April 1942. And they came from Slovakia. That was a surprise to me. I hadn't read a great deal about, um, about these early transports, about the role of Slo Slovakia in the Holocaust. And essentially the pro-fascist government in Slovakia sold their Jewish girls to the Germans. They paid 500 Reichsmarks for single women to go off to a work camp. They would be going off to work. And so these young women who were called up, they packed their suitcase, they put on very sensible, sturdy working clothes, and they left for an unknown destination. They arrived at Auschwitz. And these were the first, the first women prisoners to arrive. They went through the terrifying induction process. And I spoke earlier of clothes holding your identity. Well, they also hold your dignity. And so to be stripped in public very brutally, to be shouted at, to be abused, to take off your clothes was one very deliberate tactic, tactic of the Nazis to take away your feeling of strength, your perhaps feeling of dignity. And also for women in particular, young women, many of them, they were assaulted while they're being undressed, but also to be naked to be made naked in public. And this, this wasn't a coincidence. This was a very deliberate part of the dehumanization of prisoners. And instead of being given their own clothes back, and I think of the, I think of the women packing, packing clothes that they've, that maybe their, their mothers have made for them, you know, knitted sweaters or clothes they bought themselves on a shopping trip in Bratislava. And then all of that's gone, that's taken away. So you're not tethered to those memories anymore. And they were given used Russian uniforms from Russian men, POWs, who'd been murdered prior to their arrival. And their hair was shaved, body hair, head hair, all their jewelry taken, everything taken, their names taken, and numbers supplied instead. And so this very clearly shows the Nazis understood the power of clothing and the power of imagery with clothing. And if I can show you now a couple more documents, I have, I love the um, contemporary magazines are fascinating for what they show or don't show. And here is one of the National Socialist magazines um, printed. This one's from 1939. It's called Frauenwarte. And essentially it's part of, it's, it's a women's group. Women have been ousted from political power and from, from most power systems in the 1930s when Hitler comes to power. But this magazine is to teach people, to teach women their role within National Socialism. So many images of maternal caring, many images of beauty, but not too much beauty and emphasize that it's not foreign beauty. The xenophobia is, is very clear. Uh, there are recipes, there are dressmaking patterns, but the cover here I think is very striking. 
the Nazis were very clear on the power of imagery and very gendered imagery. So there, again, there we see the masculine ideal in 1939, a man in uniform. He's monolithic, he's impassive. There are no human sentiments on that face. He has a tin helmet, he has a wool coat. And this is very much in contrast then with the image of the stylish woman. So the idea of uniform showing that you are part of something, that you belong, it's really obvious in public spectacles such as the famous infamous Nuremberg rallies, massed ranks of almost anonymous men. And yet for women, as I say, a little different. So the Nazis knew this power of controlling what they, how they think people should behave by showing them how they should look. We're, we're just gonna start, just keep going. Thank you. Well, well, we have, we've had an interruption and we are back. We are resilient ourselves and uh, undaunted, but um, yes, it is quite striking to know that there are, there are still so many reasons to present history now. It's still so relevant. Many of the messages, many of the things that we write about when writing about the Holocaust are still absolutely fundamentally needing to be heard now. And uh, so I've been talking, I've been talking about images and how Nazis controlled images, but it goes much more powerful than that. These connections between uh, clothing and national socialism and, and policies of the Third Reich. So what these women all have in common, these young Jewish women deported from Slovakia, it is their Jewishness, they're deported simply because they are Jewish, no other reason. But what they have in common is that they're all dressmakers to a certain extent. This young woman here is Marta Fuchs. Marta was 25 when she was deported and she'd run a salon, a fashion salon in Bratislava in Slovakia. And she was related by marriage to Irina Reichenberg here. And Irina's friend, Rene, a rabbi's daughter, all from Bratislava. And then Irina's other friend, Bracha, Bracha Berkovich, here with her sister, Katka. And this is where I come to a different kind of source material, because some of these women left testimonies. Those who survived were able to be part of the Shoah Foundation video testimonies. And so you can hear them speak uh, about their experiences. But I had the great good fortune of connecting with Bracha Berkovich, pictured here, who uh, married and became Bracha Kovut. And I went out to meet her in San Francisco in 2019 to interview her. And that is another element of, of say, source material. She was also a very, very welcoming and interesting human being, of course. But to be able to speak with people who were there, to be able to ask those questions that the documents and the images don't show, that was incredibly interesting. And Bracho was the last surviving dressmaker of the Auschwitz Fashion Salon and had many, many memories of her friends uh, and relatives there. And when I went to visit Bracho, I took with me a dress from the 1940s. And it's often the case, I think, when speaking with people about their memories of the past, that they have a sort of almost a script, not that they're making it up, but you know, we get in the habit, don't we, when we're telling stories of our lives, of telling it a certain way. And I think this must be particularly true for people who've experienced such intense trauma. You put things in compartments and you take things out in a manageable way when you're sharing them. And of course, when you watch video testimonies or when you, you're interviewing people who've endured trauma, you can also see what happens when the compartments aren't strong enough and sometimes things spill over. So when I was speaking with Bracha, I took out this dress, it's a beautiful red embellished dress and she changed almost, you know, she'd been speaking very freely, very frankly about her time in the camps. And then suddenly she became tactile. She entered a different mode. You know, you could almost see her brain changing, different memories coming out and accessing through the power of the senses, different memories. And this has happened with in many instance, instances. You know, you, you show someone a wooden camp shoe and suddenly those, again, those compartments become porous and the memories come out. So I'm going to show you a dress now. And this dress will have you know, personal resonance for you. It doesn't for me even, 
I don't know who wove it, designed it, stitched it, sold it, wore it. I don't know any of its history. Um, clothing can be an incredibly powerful source of information, particularly when you're writing about dressmakers. Although when I say dressmakers, Marta was very much a very talented cutter. The cutter is someone who can turn two-dimensional images into three-dimensional garments. It's extremely talented. But Bracha and Rene and Irina were not dressmakers by trade. They were only dressmakers because of anti-Semitic laws in Slovakia that essentially stopped their studies. They were ejected from schools. They were stopped from working. They had no means of gaining a livelihood. But for many women at this time, sewing was a regular domestic skill. And so they actually took lessons, these young women, they took lessons on the underground, if you will, just learning a basic skill that they thought might be useful, little realizing it would save their lives. So this dress here may look very ordinary and pretty and lovely. It's apple green crepe. It's silk crepe, which the moths have enjoyed at some point in its history. And you might think, well, what does this very pretty little tea gown have to do with the Holocaust? It does tell us, first of all, it does tell, tell us something about economy. And it tells us something about life in Germany. This is a German dress from about 1939. So it tells us something about civilian life at this time because it's a very economical dress. There's not a lot of fabric wasted. It's got very narrow seams and hem, very little detailing on it hardly any fabric used and so it it shows that civilians are having to make do with less there is not an abundance for most people unless you're one of the elite ss women and this is also reflected in dressmaking patterns at the time so this is from the same year and this is a single sheet of tissue paper overlaid both sides with an extraordinary crisscross of pattern pieces. These are all the garment pieces that you would need for making about 20 garments on one piece of paper. You have to be a genius, I think, to decode all of this. The reason why? We've got a paper shortage. So Germany is rearming, it's remilitarized, and money, is, money and resources are being diverted towards militarization, towards invasion. There's very little left for everyday civilian occupations. So this dress tells us that we're skimping. We're not yet rationed in Germany, but we're skimping. But what's most sinister is how this dress is absolutely saturated with anti-Semitism, because a very direct part of Nazi policies is plunder. And I was struck so much researching this book, just how much greed was a motivator as well as the, the racial hatred. And so plunder, the idea is that if you dehumanize someone, if you other them, they become more vulnerable. And when someone's vulnerable, you can take over their assets. And in 1933, just a few weeks after Hitler came to power, a group of German Aryan businessmen met in Berlin. And I say Aryan, it's this invented concept which essentially means non-Jewish. And these businessmen met to decide how they could dispossess all Jewish assets from the fashion trade, the fashion and textile trade, which was very much supported by Jewish capital, by Jewish entrepreneurialism, by Jewish talents and Jewish labor. So from factories to department stores to little boutiques such as the one Marta had in Slovakia, there is so much Jewish talent and money in fashion. And these Aryan businessmen wanted it for themselves. They didn't want fair competition. And so they established an organization called ADEFA. That's the acronym. And I'm going to show you the, leaf, the label now. A-D-E-F-A. -E Essentially, in English, it means German Aryan Federation of Garment and Textile Manufacturers. The Aryan is the insert. And part of their policies had a very direct effect on Jewish livelihoods because they were looking to eliminate all Jews from the garment trade. 
And they did this by bullying, by enforcing, uh, by forcing emigration and liquidation of businesses, and by theft, by purchasing businesses for nominal sums or by just taking them. And they did all of this with the complete support of National Socialists uh, government, because of course, looting was all part of their agenda too. Hermann Goering states this very clearly. He says, I intend to loot and to loot thoroughly. So it's a cash grab. And ADEFA are successful in that respect. They eventually wind up the business having eliminated, having rendered the garment trade unified, Jew free. And of course, more sinisterly, Germany is also looking to, to render the whole country unified, Jew free, and the whole of Europe. So these links between economy and industry are really powerful, the links between that and anti-Semitic policies. So this dress looks incredibly pretty, but the message sent out by ADEFA and by all of the garment industries linked with national socialist policies, the message was buy only from Aryans. And this is explicitly stated, I've got here a booklet of knitting yarn samples, and it's explicitly stated in the front, Aryan only production. And so this brings us to what are often called bystanders, those people who, they weren't working in concentration camps, they weren't actively murdering people, but they had to make those choices on, a, on an everyday basis as consumers to go into a shop. Well, first of all, do you go into the shop? If it's a Jewish milliner's, a Jewish boutique, a Jewish department store, are you going to risk the wrath of the brown shirts, risk public censure by going in? Are you going to be defiant and say, no, I'm buying from a Jewish shop? And then once you're in these stores, are you going to look out for the Adefa label as a sign that no Jewish hands have touched this garment? And so even now as consumers, you know, we face those dilemmas, don't we? How complicit are we in, in, in abuses of industry? So I think that's a very interesting and very sinister aspect to the fashion trade. That lovely apple green dress. So since I'm talking about Germany in 1939, I'm going to introduce you to another dressmaker here, Hunia. And Hunia was from Slovakia also, but she'd moved to Germany in the 1930s to establish her own fashion salon in Leipzig. So Hunia was very much um, an eyewitness of the, the escalation of anti-Semitism. She was present in Leipzig during Kristallnacht, the violence then. And she eventually had to close down her workshop. She, um, she, couldn't, she couldn't sew anymore. She wasn't permitted to have a trade. And she had been sewing for Jews and non-Jews. She'd been sewing for the elite of Leipzig. But she was directed into the next stage of Nazi policies regarding textiles and Jewish involvement with the textile trade, which is forced labor. So having had organizations such as ADEFA, which was essentially saying Jew-free clothing, the Germans realized that they had a skill shortage. Who's going to do this labor? Jewish people. So they, people corralled into ghettos or people unable to flee, in, in Hunia's case, unable to flee Leipzig. They were put into forced labor situations, having to work for bread or having to work for the right to life. And this is very clearly seen in ghettos of occupied Poland, which supplied not only goods for the Wehrmacht and the SS, but also huge quantities of civilian garments. And the idea was that if Jewish people work, they can live. But I wonder if the Jewish people receiving these, sorry, the German people back home receiving these clothes had any idea that they'd been stitched in a ghetto in occupied Poland. I wonder if the, the men of the Wehrmacht had any idea that their clothing, their uniforms were stitched by Jews. These Jews that they were being told to hate, the Jews perhaps that they did hate, they were anti-Semitic. And I've got here another image, this time, for, this is from 1942, from Die Dame, the Lady magazine, one of the longest running fashion magazines in Germany. And it shows fragments of furs being turned into warm garments for the Wehrmacht. And of course, fighting in the East, fighting against Russians, they need all the warm clothes they can get. But this is propaganda too. We look at these well-dressed, elegant young women as if it's all just another day at the sewing machine. But the reality was it was enslaved labor. 
that carried out the majority of the fur work and much of the fur was stolen from Jewish people. Although German Aryan civilians, Gentiles, uh, handed over furs as part of great collection drive, the furs were, were stolen. They were stolen from Jewish people in ghettos and those arriving at concentration camps. And Hunya became one of these forced laborers, sewing in one of the fur factories in Leipzig until her deportation in 1943. So that's given you something of a background uh, about those links between sewing and clothes and, and national socialism. And then we come to arrival in a concentration camp. And it's very obvious from the first few months that these young women stand very little chance of survival. They're put to working in construction sites and demolition. Irina helps build the new gas chambers in Birkenau with their bare hands. And so they understand that brutality and starvation and disease will kill them. They cannot, they cannot live like this. So inevitably, people start looking for better work. And some of these first Slovakians to be transported, they become part of this, the camp hierarchy, they become very adept at thinking, how are we going to help each other survive? And Marta is the core. Marta takes on work at the Hus Villa, the Commandant's house. And she starts work as a sort of au pair, bizarrely, looking after the Hus children. And this reminds me very much of, of all situations, I think, of enslaved people who are entrusted with the household goods and with children, but are still treated as subhuman, as inferior. And Hedvig Huss was utterly guilty of this too. And she had Marta in the house, and one day Hedvig sa said that she had a fur coat that needed remodeling. Marta said, I can do that. And Marta's sewing skills were so good that Hedvig took Marta on as a seamstress in her house, in the attic of the, the Huss Villa, overlooking the concentration camp. And one thing struck me that Hedvig said to Marta that reveals so much about the psychology of these elite SS people. She said, but I didn't know Jews, Jews could work, let alone so beautifully. I thought you spent all your time in coffee shops, you know, in cafes drinking coffee. And so this, this hideous myth of the parasitic Jew, you know, this propaganda, Hedvig is seeing with her own eyes the talent of Marta. And yet even then, she couldn't see Marta as, as a human being. Now, I can't tell you all of the, the background here of, of, uh, of the fashion salon because I don't have time. But in short, Marta used her position in the Huss household to save other lives. She got another woman in saying, oh, I need help and I need help sewing. There's too much sewing for, for one person. And so she saved a woman called Berta, Berta Weiss. And Berta had a 14 year old niece, Rojika, who would never have survived on her own. They said, oh, we definitely need, we need Rojika, you know, for picking up pins and running errands. So in comes Rojika. And then all the other SS wives at the camp, because the life for the SS is normalized by having excuse me, families and children coming to live with pretty gardens and everything you could possibly want, you know, in those houses outside the camp. The other SS wives get envious of Hedvig and her amazing seamstresses. And they say, well, we want, we want lovely clothes making for us too. And so Hedvig establishes the fashion salon and it's in the SS administration building. So this amazing white building just at the edge of the main camp, which is now a school. It's still there. You can go and see it. And here there are 300 inmates, mainly female, mainly Jewish, who are working in administration. They are filing and typing and transcribing interrogation notes. Uh, so they're all part of this, this horrific Nazi bureaucracy. But there's also a beauticians for the SS, a masseur, a couple of hairdressers, there's the laundry room, the mending room for the SS, I could tell you so much about this, but then an elite couture sewing salon. And here Marta establishes a workshop, she becomes the capo or the boss, you know, of, of this work commando, and she uses her position again to save lives. So around her, she is absolutely well aware of the purpose of Birkenau now as an extermination center. She's had, she's absolutely well aware of the, the death toll. She's aware of how close they are to mortality, but she is far more human 
than her dressmaker clients because she decides to use her power to save lives. And first of all, it's people that she's connected to. So Irina, her relative. And then Irina says, well, I've got a friend, Rene. Can we get her in? And Irina says, oh, my friend, Bracha. Can we get Bracha in? And Bracha says, my sister, Katka. Can we get her in? And so these networks of friendships and family connections are crucial to survival. Without them, Renee said she would certainly she would certainly have succumbed to d- disease and starvation and just the brutality around it. She couldn't she couldn't handle it. And so this dressmaking room, there were two rooms, in fact, a large workshop and a fitting room. They become this haven. And although there was a core, there came to be a core uh, in the later years of the council operation of about 25 women from my research. And it's still ongoing. I think there were 40 women who passed through this salon including some French political prisoners who'd been with the French resistance and who'd been arrested and they came to work there too. So that's 40 lives that had a better chance of survival. And there's a lot I could tell you about the work in the Salon, which you can read in the book. And it's fascinating to see how these women found that this new kind of work was not degrading, it was not brutal. It reminded them of their skills. It reminded them that they were capable people And because of Marta's influence, she was a very clever, very compassionate woman. It reminded them that they had something to live for, that they would look out for each other and that they they could talk. They had memories of home. They could talk of loved ones who'd been murdered. They could hope for people still on the outside that they hoped would escape deportation. They uh, had education classes. They had culture for those who were religious. There was an opportunity for clandestine uh, observance of religious um, ceremonies and to to pray. Just that sense that they were full human beings, which of course everything the Nazis did was to demonstrate that they were subhuman, that they were vermin. And remarkably, Marta also used her connections and a lot of these were in the warehouses of plunder. She used her connections to join the Auschwitz underground Specifically, she was linked with communist elements of the underground, and she used this opportunity for spreading information, which is absolutely crucial for hope. She was able to pass on messages from the BBC uh, broadcast. She was also able to share information around the camp that was crucial to them to smuggle out. But she also was part of the network smuggling food where possible to give out where, ne- well, where needed. Everybody needed it, but also medicine. And she was able to smuggle out messages. And I have just copies here. The family found these. They they weren't aware that uh, Marta had these in her possession after the war, but copies here of a front and back of postcards that Marta was able to send out of this administration block because they were all part of the bureaucracy. And these postcards, they don't describe her experiences in the camp. They don't describe the horrors, they don't describe the suffering because they're all still starving. They're all still well aware that one mistake, one mistake, one angry client, and they're going to the gas, to put it bluntly. She she writes with love. She writes with love and thanks. And all of the, all of the time that I was speaking with Bracha, the survivor who I went to meet, she wasn't interested in the SS. I asked her about Hedvig, I asked her about the clients and she just, she wasn't so interested. She wanted to talk about her loved ones. And I think that's also another a very profound element that for all that Hus, the commandant sneered at Jewish prisoners saying, oh, they'll fight each other for a piece of bread. They have no family loyalty. He wrote in his uh, autobiography, under his very nose in his own house, there were networks of Jewish people proving that they were more human, more humane than he would ever be. So you can read about the the resistance, you can read about the the work in in the workshop, you can read about client interactions, you know, what was it like to work for the SS and see these women close to. And then I've done a chapter on escape and liberation because Marta was actually scheduled that's the right word, to escape in 1944. The prisoners in Birkenau were very aware that the the new rail spur being built was intended to facilitate the destruction of Hungarian Jews. 
And so they were determined that someone needed to get out and tell the world about, uh, about this, this impending tragedy. And in the end, it was two chaps, Rudolf Ferber and Alfred Wetzler, who managed to escape, but Marta would have been next on the list if they had not been successful. And uh, incidentally was, was friends with, with Rudy and Freddie, as she called them after the war. So she didn't, she didn't need to escape in that regard because the, the Verba Wetzler report was circulated and some of the deportations from Hungary were stopped. But I just wanted to tell you that, just to give you that sense of, you know, this dressmaking salon, this fashion salon, while they're making clothes for, for the SS elite and even for SS women in Berlin. Hunya testified that they made clothes for the very highest names in Berlin, but annoyingly never said what names they were and the order book has been lost or destroyed, but there was a big black order book that Marta kept. Marta kept. And they were so in demand, these women, that there was a six month waiting list for the, the elite women in Berlin for their fashions. Hunya said they created clothes these women could not have imagined in their wildest dreams. So while all of this is going on, needle and thread and sewing machine, Marta is part of resistance. And it's something that, something that we, we should all talk about more, looking at it from the, the victim perspective, if you will. And this resistance was in such small things, such small acts of kindness. They didn't have weapons. They didn't, they, they were very indirectly uh, connected with the Zonderkommando uprising in October 1944. But in their own ways, every single day, these women were resisting through their humanity, through their, their generosity, these, this network of, of mainly female friendships. Marta did make an escape attempt and it was on the death march. And you can, you can read about the, uh, the repercussions of that. But she kept, she annotated, as you guess, she does survive. She annotated a diary. And here's a very small fragment copied of this diary. You can see very small writing, somewhat damaged as well, of her time in January 1945. And it's written on office stationery, which uh, I strongly suspect came from the SS admin block. So, very this is a very brief you know i've rushed through telling you something about these remarkable women each one of them so full of life and so full of of character particularly hunya uh, was certainly one of the most defiant women i'd ever met she even gave back chat to ss guards and so on and it's hunya that i'm going to end with now before um before opening up to to questions and further discussions and it involves me showing you one more garment and this is the most remarkable garment in my collection. I have a collection that spans 300 years of textiles and accessories. So we're talking um, 18th century embroideries, Victorian crinoline gowns. And I have, I have some couture. I do have couture, I have some Dior. But to me, it's the clothes with stories that are really powerful and I particularly focus on garments from the 1930s and 40s and as I said before we don't always know what the stories are but this garment I do. So this is a two-piece suit from the 1950s so we're now in the post-war era and when I was writing the book I thought it was, it was incredibly important to write about the women's lives after the war because for those who survived which was a majority of the seamstresses in this salon, thanks to Marta. Those who survived, they had to pick up the pieces somehow. They had to rehumanize themselves in the sense of they took off their concentration camp clothes and put on civilian clothes. Many of them from German houses, they were liberated uh, from a camp called Malhof in Germany. They had to make their way home again, but what's home? without their loved ones who'd been murdered. And they had to start work again because they had to dig deep within themselves to find a way to continue. And one of the first objects that they all looked for was a sewing machine. Marta opened a salon after the war and continued her sense of solidarity by asking the other survivors to come and join her and sew for her. Uh, other women were very eager to, to emigrate because life in post-war Czechoslovakia was, was certainly not easy for anyone, but the lingering anti-Semitism was very frightening, of course. And so they looked to emigrate to the British Mandate of Palestine, 
uh, becoming Israel, or to go elsewhere in Europe, to go across to the USA and Canada. And Is uh, Hunya made it to Tel Aviv. And Hunya there met her niece for the first time, her niece Gila, and Gila was warned. Before Hunya's ship docked in Haifa, she was warned that Hunya wore nail varnish. <laughs> Just like, who is this woman who has survived the camps and she's wearing nail varnish? But Gila and Hunya struck up quite a strong relationship because Hunya was living in Gila's apartment for a while and Hunya was sewing. She was sewing for some of the very nice elite uh, fashion shops along George Allenby Street in Tel Aviv near the boardwalk and she brought all the sewing home. But she also sewed for her family and Hunya sewed this. She turned one of her own dresses into a suit for Gila, her niece, and it's incredibly stylish. Gila loved it. And when I look at this and I look at the well, very hasty finishing inside, in fact, but fantastic cut, I think it's worth remembering those invisible people, the people who do, do our labor, the people who make our clothes. Because in this case, although this dress has no label, I know that it was made by Hunya, Hunya Volkman, survivor of Auschwitz. Hunya, who once made clothes for the commandant's wife. And it was made with love. It was not made to survive. It was made for her niece. And while Hunya sat sewing, Gila sat writing. And she wrote down all of Hunya's memoirs into what she called a memory book. And that's why we, we have so much knowledge about Hunya. So all of these sources together, the textiles, the magazines, the documents, the photographs, the memories, the interviews, they give us a glimpse, something of these women's lives. And it has been a very harrowing, but a very important thing for me to do as a writer, as a historian, to play my part in ensuring that these fragments are not lost and not forgotten. And the work continues. We have just, uh, I, I've just recently tracked down a little Rojika, the little 14 year old girl who was brought in to pick up pins. And I've been speaking with her son. She's sadly, she's, she's dead now, but it's just incredible to me to know that these fragments, that they are there, these stories are there. And overwhelmingly, the sense I get from, from testimonies and from interviews is the intense female friendships, the camaraderie, the resilience of these women is remarkable. And when Hunya in later life was asked to say to what did she credit her survival in the camps, she said, first of all, luck, because of course as prisoners, you know, so much is out of their control. And then she said, a good capo, so that would be Marta, and sewing skills. So never underestimate those three, luck, the connections, and your skills. So I, I have whisked through telling you something about these, these remarkable and yet somehow ordinary women. They should have been ordinary women. They should have just been, they should have been able to be at home, you know, making clothes, making love, making money, making babies, whatever. But their, their lives were altered forever, of course, by their experiences. And now these women are extraordinary. So I'm, I'm really pleased to have shared and also quite staggered at how many people are interested in this aspect of history because the book has, has been, it, it will be translated into many languages worldwide, including Hebrew, and, and it's reached you today. So I would like to thank you for joining me and I'm sorry we had the hiatus earlier, but we're here now and it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, I know it's late there, right? Is it uh, eight o'clock? Oh, no, seven o'clock. Okay. Time to put the kettle on. It's not late. All right. So um, questions. Thank you, um, everyone. I, we have fewer people than we did. And some of those people we don't have, it's good we don't have them. Um, questions in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand, I'm going to change the view so that I can see more of you. Uh, there you go. Thank you. I, first of all, I want to thank you, Chris, for for helping us regroup so fast. And and Lucy, it, it's incredible, incredible to witness how you your reassuring voice that how important this work is not to be deterred. Um, we know how can we be right? And I I just want I have a, a, a comment and like. 
actually questions and questions. I'm going to limit to just two. Uh, first of all, your storytelling is as riveting as your uh, yourself in in written words. It, it's incredible. I, I could just sit here. I love the way you talk about you know that cloth is a part of our identity, and that is so much you know cloth tells us everything. And indeed, through telling this, these incredible, never ordinary women. So dress making, surviving, you know, making dress to survive. Um, it's a universal element. I've written about this globally in the 1940s, uh, you know, women's lives during the war in, in so many different countries. And just these, yeah, just these so overlooked skills, whether it's domestic caring skills or the cooking or the sewing, just thinking you could not have a civilization right. or a home to go back to without all of this going on simultaneously with war. And I have two questions, so very briefly. One, how has written this book, researching on these extraordinary lives, um, changed you as a person, as a writer? And second, what's the feedback from the survivors on your book? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I'm gonna answer the second one first, if I may. Um, when I went to visit Bracha in 2019, she, I mean, I'd been working on this project for a long time, but it, it gathered momentum when my novel came out and I was able finally to find the identities of dressmakers. And so, you know, of course, research can, can blossom from there. When I arrived in San Francisco, I'd only just sent out a proposal to my agent saying, you know, I'm, I told her I'm gonna write this book. I said, you know, I'm just writing it. And she said, okay, well, well, we'll pitch it to publishers. And it was the very same day that I arrived at Bracca's house that I got an inclination of just how many people worldwide would be interested in this story. I mean, it was staggering to me. And so I told Bracker and her family that was so welcoming. I said, you know, I, said, I think this book's going to be published a lot. And she was just like, do you want some apple strudel? So in some ways, you know, it was, well, of course you feed, you know, in some ways, I don't think it quite, it quite hit home. But on a more profound level, she was very pleased to tell her story. She had given testimony before, but this element had never been brought out. And perhaps she'd been a little overshadowed by the fact that her, her husband had also had a story to tell. And perhaps, you know, inevitably, you know, some of his stories were seen as more interesting or, or you know, of, of more fitting a narrative that people were used to. And unfortunately for the other women, they were they were all dead I mean some by only a couple of years when I came to write the book but for their families can you imagine for second and third generation to be able to realize you know that their their loved ones are valued of course they're valued by the family but that other people they care that they're angry at the persecution that they're feeling compassionate for what the women went through that they're honoring their skills and their connections it has, I think it's changed all of us a bit and the connections worldwide now that, you know, the second and third generations now in touch with each other. And, you know, I'm able to say, oh, did you know Marta so-and-so in this? So that, I think that has changed us all. And certainly Bracha's family have been, um, they've very much taken up this sense of, you know, honoring their mother. Sadly, Bracha died of COVID last year. And for myself for writing it, of course it's changed me you can become involved in something that is so it, it's not objective I mean there is a lot of objective work and there's a lot of you know the, the archival analysis is objective but I wrote this book during lockdowns in the UK for Covid mm. and every time I felt despondent I thought of Baraka who was an optimist mm. And she just said, we are getting out, we are getting out, we are going to have coffee and cake. And Irina said, no, we're all going to go up the chimneys, we're not going to make it. She said, you are going to make it. And I thought of her so much and I thought of how lucky, you know, I am to, you know, every time I have coffee and cake now, I think, yes, thank you, Baraka, we, we are, we have coffee and cake. So it reinforced certainly for me that sense of we have to hold on to those things. And it also made me very aware of communities now. So reading pe about people's responses in the 1930s, you know, I talked a bit about bystanders, looking at how communities have reacted during the last two years in particular. And there are little micro choices that we make. Are we gonna support each other as a community? 
are we going to be divisive you know and that to me has been staggering and more than ever I think this this did not happen in another time in another place to other people this is this is universal it's happening now in different parts of the world it just has different uniforms and different names so definitely a strong sense of connection and definitely holding on to that coffee and cake I think I'm, I'm, while, while you're preparing another question, I'm just going to add, I think it changed, it's changed people who've read it as well. I've been um, overwhelmed at the responses of people saying, well, I knew it was bad. I didn't know it was that bad. Or I'd never stopped to think about women's experiences in the camps. Or, oh, I never thought about my mother or grandmother or so. And she was always sewing and knitting for us. So I, I hope it's, it's connected, created resonance with readers too. Thank you. I, I guess I'm, I'm, uh, I can go ahead and ask a question. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted. Uh, I, I wanted to, you know, join uh, Trish in thanking uh, Lucy for this incredible uh, presentation and also Chris for uh, arranging it. And uh, uh, one, 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 one word that uh, Trish used that it was uh, riveting, which reminded me of, because uh, you're talking about clothing, there was a recent documentary on uh, PBS, uh, I guess in the US, on uh, history of, of uh, denim. Yeah. And it was, uh, that, that, was, uh, that was amazing, just as a digression, because it, it was really also about the connection between denim and uh, slavery in the United States, which was... Cotton, obviously, but yes, denim. I live in uh, Yorkshire in England, which has uh, does have very strong links with the, the slave trade and exporting of, they were even called slave blankets, you know, the certain quality wool. Uh, we didn't produce denim here so much, but everything, everything is connected. I could talk to you so much on that subject, but yes, thank you for making that connection. So my, my question was about, uh, <clears throat> while you're talking about, you know, cl clothing as this kind of medium of survival, I was struck by something in, in your book on page uh, 232, 231, 232, where you talked about the fact that the, uh, the women in, in the salon, uh, I guess, had certain privileges in terms of their uh, dormitory space. And uh, at, at night, they were able to form a kind of intellectual community. You, you mentioned this uh, and, and, and form study groups for the study of uh, different languages or literature and ideas. And I thought that was uh, an important reference to this idea that, that literature and learning are also kind of a medium of survival for people. It reminded me of uh, Primo Levi's book Survival in Auschwitz, where he, he uh, recounts, you know, uh, discussing Dante's Inferno with, with another prisoner. And for him, this recollection of literature and his uh, sort of uh, it, it, Italian culture was a transcendent moment that, that helped, helped him survive. So I thought that was a really important insight in your- they had, Yeah, they had a con, they put on concerts and the SS insisted on seeing the concerts. I remember uh, Hunya at one point mentions being in, in the hospital, she was very ill next to an, an Arabic dancer and they were chatting about this concert, you know, and they're both ill and, oh you, yes. I mean, that's another thing, trying to read about how prisoners, some of the more privileged prisoners were able to put on plays. You know, you have French prisoners putting on Moliere. I think it's anything that reminds you that you are not what you've been told you are that the image of you as an emaciated creature vermin or whatever in the, the striped uniforms or the Russian POW uniforms you know this big theatric of, of the SS supremacy to remind you that no you are that person within you are a person who was once a mathematician or once a mother or a dressmaker whatever it takes so definitely for the women in the admin block the intellectual life was important although I think Irina said she gave up Russian lessons pretty early on because she uh, she found them too difficult, although they did need them later on in her experience. But again, it just I suppose it just reminds us that humans, you know, that they're, they're constantly seeking out their nourishment, and it's not just you know physical nourishment; it's that that mental, the cerebral and emotional nourishment. So, 
I think after the war, Irina became quite an avid reader. She had a lot of history books, possibly because, you know, inspired by the people, a range of people that she would never have met before. She met a lot of, of intellectuals. Sorry, go on. Oh, I was just, no, I was just saying thank you very much for the book and for the presentation today. You're very welcome. Gary, I think you had a question and also thank you very much for your email. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I missed a good part of this because of that interruption. I didn't, didn't get the, uh, the link. So I wanted to know if you had ever come across the name Alana Burke. Uh, she ended her life in Nebraska. Um, she was a dressmaker, but she was also uh, made to be an interpreter for Mengele. So she had a really odd um, relationship, but I'm as a dressmaker, I'm sure that she knew these women. If she, uh, if yeah. Um, if, if you're able to email me, you can contact me through my website, which is lucyadlington.com. Um, okay. uh, there's a contact form because the one of the, another reason that I know so much about the dressmakers is a survivor called Laura Shelley. Uh, she was born Laura Weinberg in Germany. She was working in the Stabsgebäude in the admin block. And so she was responsible in the 1980s and 90s for saying, why don't we have these people's testimonies? And so she knew a lot of the, the typists and translators and transcribers. So what I can do is I'll check through all of her notes. Her archives are in San Francisco, they're fascinating. And if Ilona was, um, if she was dormitoried at the Stabsgebäude, then she will be one of these yeah. 300 women. Yeah, I, do, I don't know that. Her son, her son lives in the Detroit area. I knew mm -hmm. her for many years. Um, and she didn't talk a lot about it, uh, about her time in Auschwitz. I just knew these things about her. And she was a dressmaker and hat maker until the end of her life. She right. died in her 90s. Um, oh, my other so question. Must, please do get in touch. I would love to hear more. My, uh, my other question had to do with um, testimonies. Were any of the testimonies of these women videotaped or, or filmed? Yes, um, the little Rojica, uh, I haven't listened to her testimony yet. I've only just tracked her down. Um, she's spoken. Eraina's testimony is in German and her son had a very emotional time. He translated it for me. My German isn't, isn't nuanced enough. And that was his way, a second generation of, uh, sort of engaging very fully with his mother's experiences. So yes, Bracha also spoke, but it's, it's at um, the Tauber Holocaust library so i think it's only access accessible there mm -hmm. uh when you did not and in fact a lot of the women including marta were invited to participate in dr laura shelley's work you know collating testimonies and of them uh, only Hunya complied out of these slovakian women marta was repeatedly asked to testify at the trials because she'd been so you know, intimately involved in the, the household and she consistently refused and we can we can speculate I mean maybe similar to your friend what is it like to have to work cheap by jowl with people mm -hmm. that you despise but who are also ironically your means of life you know she said that her saved her life on numerous occasions so um so yes there are some testimonies but of course when the when the women were interviewed by um whenever in in the 1990s Nobody thought to hone in on the fact that they've been working in the salon. And I think it, it takes an outsider who's got an interest in, in dress history to, to realize the immense significance of it. So yes, please do contact me about your friend and we'll see if we can track down, um, and, and if not her, then perhaps some of the women she knew and worked with. I ask because, of, because I'm a journalist and filmmaker and when there are um, testimonies, I'm, I'm looking for ways to use it for Holocaust education. Yeah, I, I, it is so powerful, isn't it, when you hear people speaking and uh, although there are segments and you know, I can pass on the um, yeah. testimony numbers, sometimes you just wanna be there in person, don't you, and speaking to the person. And my own filming of the interview with Bracha was, you know, she actually told me to stop recording. She just said, you listen. And she just wanted me there. I saw I just had pen and paper. I was just doing it very, very old school. Um, so sadly, not as much footage, not as much footage as, as we would like in that sense. Okay, thank you very much for doing this. I'm okay. sorry I didn't know about your book ahead of time, but I'll, uh, I'll look into it. It's only been on the bestseller list since September. How could you possibly know? <laughs> <laughs>
I've been inside a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Deb, you have a question? Okay, there we go. Um, hi, you. Lucy. Uh, thank you. This was really a fantastic talk. I'm the um, co-director of Judaic Studies, and we are really honored to be co-sponsors of this event. I want to um, I want to tell everyone, uh, and I'll try to be brief. A, um, a a little story. This is about my mom, who um, who was a Holocaust survivor, and um, in 1942, living in Czechoslovakia, she was 17 years old. And she went into an arranged marriage with my father, who at the time was 21 years old. Um, she was from a well-to-do family and she was supposed to become a doctor, uh, follow in the footsteps of her grandfather and become a doctor. And of course, uh, the Nazis coming into Czechoslovakia at the time changed everything. Um, so at the age of 17, she was married to my father who within a couple of years, he had very ironically, it's, an, it's another story within itself, um, had American citizenship. Um, so he was able to leave Czechoslovakia and uh, go back to the States in order to try to get my mom out at one point. Um, she eventually went to a ghetto. She was relocated with her family to a ghetto um, in, the, um, in the Prague area. And um, she, at the age of 21, was finally able to leave the country, came to the States with, uh, with no money, very little money, very few, very few skills, um, and became a dressmaker um, and worked her uh, nearly her entire life until she retired as a dressmaker. She became a very skilled dressmaker. It certainly was not in the cards for her to ever do that. Um, I can't say that, I, I don't think she ever really fully enjoyed being a dressmaker, although she, she as I said, was, was very good at it, but she ended up being able to support the family. So that was a, a different type of <laughs> survival. That is so common to be the breadwinner through dressmaking, amazing. Yeah. Well, Hunya did say, she said, she told Gila, her niece, don't become a dressmaker. She said, I know it saved my life, but you just sit there and sew. But I'm, I'm so hit, pleased to hear this story of, of people who, who got out, who made it through and to use skills like that, perhaps not the skills she had in mind. Wow. Yes, and when you say, you know, she said, don't become a dressmaker, I'll say that's what my mom always <laughs> said to us growing up was, she would never let us learn how to sew. So as the daughter of a dressmaker, I could never even you know, sew a button because she was just so determined that that was not what she wanted for us, so. But you obviously, re you remember the clothes that she made for you. Do you have any yes. left? Do you oh, have I any? Do. I do. Oh, good, good. Yes. So many people, you know, they, they're not sentimental, but I, I think it's, it's really important to hold on to those things, isn't it? Well, please, please do get in touch and show me some pictures. I would love to see them. I think the way that clothing can connect generations is, is beautiful, very poignant. Yeah. So anybody else have any, let's say final questions? We've obviously spent more time with Lucy than we, we said that we, we would impose on her. <laughs> I'm not well, we had a bit of a break. That's why we're, we're I'm here. I, I'm so pleased to be listening and talking. Yeah, it's it's great to hear. I so enjoyed the book, which is why I wanted to. And I was so pleased that just asking if you would come and you said yes. And um, it was great. And I'm sure everyone has enjoyed it. The the little hiatus in between, not so much. Um, I was so angry. I was so angry that people still have to endure this idiotic hatred and thoughtlessness and but that's why we keep doing what we do isn't it because yes. we have our choices we do our small things that counter counteract that mm -hmm. we do what we can so if there aren't any other questions um again i'll go back to gallery view so that i can see everybody um 
Thank you very much, Lucy. And we look forward to more and more work. So I, we, I have more, more of your works to read and I'm sure the rest of us will as well. And if we haven't read, if anyone hasn't read The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, it's, it's really a great work. So well, I, I hope that um, people will be inspired to, to read and to find out more. My work is continuing. I'm still, uh, my agent is a little unhappy because I'm still trying to research more about the dressmaker. She's saying, what's your next book? What are you doing next? And I, I am collating information and uh, I'm, I'm very much in the library um, teasing, out, teasing out stories and very interesting aspects of history. So I wish you, all of you, all of the best with your endeavors. And I'm so pleased that different groups have been able to, to connect and support each other and uh, wish you all the best going forward. Thank you very much. Everyone be safe, have a good afternoon. Applause, emoji applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye for now. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.